Um, that's hard to follow, Gina. <laughs> I had a hard time holding it together. Um, so this is just a simple assignment. It's nothing, it's not difficult, but what I want you to do is share with your tables for two or three minutes. Um, think of all the things or people that you love most in this world and just share it with your table. I know not all of you have had time to share, but I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, my list of favorite things would include, I, I love spending time with my family. I love taking walks with my husband, Vic. I love purebred coffee. Um, I love curling up in my recliner with my new little grandbaby, Quincy. I love reading a good book on the beach, and I also love um, traveling to new places. I have loved studying 1 Thessalonians because this theme of love is emphasized throughout this book, um, and Paul's letters teach us so much about going deeper in our love for God and for others. So as we remember from Jenny's teaching yesterday, um, Paul traveled with um, Timothy and Silas and visited the church in Thessalonica on his second missionary journey. So after preaching the gospel in the synagogue, Paul developed a, great, a deep love for these believers and expressed it abundantly throughout the book of 1 Thessalonians. So because of persecution, he was unable to be with them in person, so he wrote this letter to encourage the church to express his joy in their faith, to comfort the persecuted believers, and to embolden these believers in their faith and remind them of their conversion um, to Christ and the mutual love between the missionaries and the church of Thessalonica. So the first thing I noticed when I started, um, began studying 1 Thessalonians is that Paul calls and acts towards the Thessalonians as if they are family. In this short letter of five chapters, he uses the terms brothers and sisters 18 times. So the Greek word that he uses is phylos or phileo, and that means to be a friend to one another. It's to be fond of one another or to show affection for. So phileo love is a friendship love, and it's on the um, screen. It's an, an emotional love, and it is given as long as it's received, so it's a, it's a um, conditional love. So I want you to hear four examples of the love and tenderness in which Paul addresses them. In 1 Thessalonians 1.4, he says, For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Chapter 2, verse 14, for you, brothers and sisters, become imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. Chapter 2, verse 17, but brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by being separated from you in person, but not in thought. And then chapter 3, verse 7 says, therefore, brothers and sisters, in all of our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. Paul continues this greeting over and over again throughout this letter. But then Paul takes it one step further in 1 Thessalonians 4, 9, and he mentions the term brotherly love, which uses the Greek term Philadelphia. So phylos means beloved, and adelphos means brothers. So Paul and his re readers had believed in Jesus as Savior, and therefore they were members of God's family. God was their father, and they were brothers and sisters. The love is the love that believers, this love is the love that believers possess for one another since they are united in Christ. Brotherly love is the natural outflow of the Christian life, and Paul uses this term for the relationship of all Christians because we are adopted into the fatherhood of God. So Paul continues the theme of loving the Thessalonian believers as families. So let's read chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. It says, But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. So as Paul, Silas, and Timothy were ministering to the Thessalonians, they did not try to please man or seek personal glory, but, they, um, but rather give God the glory. Paul was gentle, and I'm going to repeat it again. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel, but our lives as well. 
So Paul's tender affection for the Thessalonians felt like a nursing mother willing to sacrifice her life for her children just as Christ was willing to sacrifice his life for ours. I love this word picture of the intense love that Paul had for his brothers and sisters as it shows love, affection, tenderness, and care. So as many of you know, my mother is suffering from dementia and she's not able to communicate much at all. And I have been cleaning out her house. So as I was cleaning, I found this journal that she wrote beginning when I was 10 days old. So as I, yeah, it is a gift, let me tell you. <laughs> um, so now I'm going to cry. So, <laughs> but um, as I was reading through it, I'm going to read a couple of the journal entries to you. So on August 7th, she wrote, Jen, you are a precious doll. We love you all day and even think you are adorable when you cry. How, can, how, how appropriate, how cute you are. Um, on August 13th, she wrote, Jen, mommy is delighted and very much relieved that you are feeling better and how I love feeding you. You just fell asleep after your midnight feeding. On September 2nd, she wrote, oh, I am exhausted. <laughs> um, Jen, when you decide to get extra loving, you really do it big. Your feeding has worn me out. We loved and we ate and now we are ready for a long night's sleep. And I think you'll like this one. On August 14th, she wrote, you kicked out of your diaper. <laughs> there you are, comfy, happy, and asleep with your ham showing. <laughs> How I love you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so as a mother and a daughter, I cried as I read through her journal just because I could feel the immense love that she had for me as her child and the immense love that I have for my children, and this is the same love that Paul has for the Thessalonian believers. After comparing the missionaries to mothers, Paul now likens them to fathers. Chapter 2, verses 11 and 12 says, For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So, First century fathers were associated with the moral and religious upbringing of their children, and Paul uses this picture of a father to exhort, to encourage, and to charge the believers to walk in a manner worthy of God. So walking in a manner worthy of God is an Old Testament metaphor that Paul uses to depict daily life in a way that pleases God but is also consistent with his character. Picture walking down a path with Paul walking along beside you, lifting you up, encouraging you, and challenging you to live in a way that will honor and glorify God. What a gift that is. So throughout Paul's letters to the Thessalonians, he repeatedly shares or shows his love for these believers as an expression of a deep desire to return back to the Thessalonians in person. So I'm going to read several examples to you um, and I want you to listen to Paul's words as if you were a Thessalonian. So chapter 2, verse 8 says, So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. Chapter 2, verses 17 through 20. But since we were torn away from you, and the NIV actually uses the word orphaned, brothers for a short time, in person, but not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face because we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our, glor our, our glory and our joy." In chapter 3, verse 5, he says, For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith, for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you, and our labor would be in vain. Chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you? For all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God, as we pray most earnestly night and day, that we may seek you, see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. So imagine the love and the encouragement that those Thessalonian believers felt, especially, they, as Jenny said yesterday, they were living in a completely pagan world and they were being persecuted. 
So loving one another is difficult, and Paul actually calls it a labor of love. So in 1 Thessalonians 1, 2, it says, We give thanks to God always for you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love, steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So when the word labor is added in there, it is certainly not like my love of coffee or reading books. Um, but it means to work to the point of exhaustion, and it is a love of blood, sweat, and tears. This, um, so why, would, why should we as believers labor in love? This question is answered in the next verse. Chapter 1, verse 4, it says, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because the gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. So we love because we are loved by God and we are chosen by him. So this is a different kind of love and the Greek word for this kind of love is agape. Agape love is used 155 times in the New Testament alone and it means to love unconditionally and sacrificially as Christ himself loves sinful men. So 155 times, it is important to God, so it must be important to us. So agapeo, or agape love, and this should be in your notes, is empowered by the Holy Spirit in the heart of the surrendered believer. It is the love with which the Father loved the Son. It is taught by God. It is shown not just by words, but with deeds and it is manifested in keeping God's commandments. So John MacArthur explains that agape love is the greatest virtue of the Christian life. Yet that type of love was rare in pagan Greek literature. That's because the traits that agape love portrays, which is unselfishness, self-giving, willful devotion, concern for the welfare of others, they were mostly disdained in ancient Greek cultures as signs of weakness. However, the New Testament declares agape to be the character trait around which all others revolve. So the, gospel, the Apostle John writes, God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him, which is 1 John 4.16, and that's an end quote. So Adrian Rogers, who was the pastor of Jenny and Jonathan Newman when they lived in Memphis, um, explains, and it, this is a very long quote, but it explains it so much better than I could, so I'll let you know when Adrian Rogers is done talking. Um, so the greatest example of agape love is, of course, God's love for us. God could have simply told us that he loves us, and that would have been enough. He is God after all, but if he says it, it is true. But God proved his love for us by sending Jesus to save us from all of our sins. God took decisive action to show the height, the depth, the breadth of his love. In John 3.16, it famously says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that who should ever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It cost God a great deal to save us from our sins. He gave up his precious, beloved, only begotten son so that we could have everlasting life. It's one thing to say that you love a person. It is something altogether different to sacrifice something that you deeply love for them. The hymn, which we sang earlier, How Deep the Father's Love for Us, says, How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. So we cannot doubt the love of God. The cross demonstrates beyond a shadow of a doubt that we are deeply, incredibly loved by God. 1 John 3.16 puts it this way, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to, ought to lay our lives down for the brethren. So the early church was committed to showing the world the incredible love of God that they had received. They cared for orphans and widows when no one else would. They gave to the poor when the rest of society rejected the impoverished. 
the sick were healed, and the lame were made to walk. So this world could not ignore this kind of love. In the face of intense opposition, Christianity spread to all corners of the world. Nothing can stand before the unstoppable love of God. That's the end quote. <laughs> we also love so that, so that the world will sit up and notice that we as believers love differently than non-believers do because we know Christ. So Jesus told his disciples, a new commandment I give to you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. John 13, 34. So as Christ gives himself for us, so we must give our lives for others. So following this verse, Jesus adds, in verse 35, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So notice the if in that scripture. It says, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So we have the choice either to obey or to disobey. Tertullian, an early disciple, an author, and an apologist from the mid-second century wrote, it is our care for the helpless, our practice of loving kindness, that brands us in the eyes of many of our opponents. Look, they say, how they love each other. Look how they are prepared to die for one another. So, how do we love each other? 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7 uses the Greek word agape to show us how to love by saying, love is patient and kind, love does not envy or boast, it is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but it rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and love never ends. So these verses are often read at weddings, including my own, and often they are forgotten. And I have heard that it's a good reminder to take out the word love and to insert your own name. So, to dis really, to examine if I display the love of Christ. So, is Jenny patient and kind? Does Jenny envy or boast? Is Jenny arrogant or rude? Does Jenny insist on her own way, or is she irritable or resentful? Does Jenny rejoice with the truth? Does Jenny bear all things, believe all things, hope all things, and endure all things? These verses are very convicting, and I am lacking in many of these areas. So, how can I love as Paul encourages and God requires? So thankfully, Paul shares these things in 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 through 10. He shares that God teaches us. It says, but concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed, you do so towards all of the brethren in Mas in, uh, all of the brethren who are in Macedonia. So God teaches us how to love, but he also gave us the Holy Spirit to help us love, excuse me, help, help us love in all times, even when it is difficult. So when I was a young child, one of the first verses that I memorized was Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, uh, as I'm not memorized, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the godly attributes that are demonstrated in the lives of those who belong to God by faith in Christ. Praise God that we are not left alone to figure these things out, but that the Holy Spirit is the one who produces the genuine love in our hearts. We see that the Holy Spirit does not produce the fruit of love apart from faith in Jesus and his word. Romans 5, 3 through 5 says, Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, Character produces hope. Hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So loving others is difficult because we're sinful and we are self-centered. The phrases that I sometimes use, like I am an introvert, I'm too busy, 
They cannot be excuses. We need the Holy Spirit to empower us to love unconditionally and to look different from the world. John Piper explains, it is impossible to love like Jesus without being empowered by the Holy Spirit because striving to love God and others like Jesus Jesus, excuse me, and others like Jesus exposes and confronts every unholy, sinful, selfish impulse of remaining sin in us, requiring us to daily put to death what is earthly in us and regularly deny ourselves for Jesus' sake and for the good of others. So God also gives us other mature um, believers to imitate. He provided Paul, Silas, and Timothy as examples to the Thessalonian believers and Paul mentions this several times in 1 Thessalonians, beginning in verses 6 and 7. And you become, became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affection, affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Paul follows up in 1 Thessalonians 3.12 by saying, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you. Paul, Silas, and Timothy abounded in love for the believers, and they were examples for the young believers to follow. Paul regularly calls believers to imitate other believers, and he instructs us in 1 Corinthians 11.1 1 by saying, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. So there's a gospel-driven chain here. So Christ is the perfect example. Paul and the missionaries would imitate Christ, and then the churches would imitate Paul. This process ultimately led to the churches imitating Christ. So have you ever met somebody that you know just by their loving demeanor and actions that you know that they're a believer? I can honestly say that my mother is one of those people. Those who have met my mom know that she loves the Lord with her whole heart, and her actions prove this. So she rarely does not have a smile on her face, and when she talks to you, it is apparent that she really cares about you. So she explained the gospel to me at a very young age and led me to the Lord. She not only cared about the salvation of, my, of, my, um, of me, but also the salvation of my friends. So when I was in the fourth and the fifth grades, she had a um, gathering at my house, and it was like a backyard Bible club, but she called it Pilgrim's Progress. So she and her friends um, would invite all of my classmates, um, and I would have a bus full of kids come home on the bus with me, fill my living room, and we would walk through the book of Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. And I remember my family room was packed. Both Christians and non-Christians came because my mom made it such a fun way to learn to share the gospel. So in the past five years, I've had two classmates contact me that I hadn't talked to probably since graduation and told me that they accepted Christ during Pilgrim's Progress. And they let me know that because of my mom, that they had repented, followed Christ, and so have their families, which is fun. So my mom taught Sunday school. She memorized scripture with me at home and led our family in a way that glorified God. More than anything, she lives her, lived her life to honor God. Her Bible was worn, and if she said that she would pray for you, she would. And I recently heard a story about my mom, and it gives you a picture of how she lived her life. So Dee Barnes, who we all know and love, worked at the hair salon that my mom went to. So my mom would talk to her, and she asked Dee if she had a relationship with the Lord a question that no one had ever asked her before. So in talking to Dee, she told me that my mom was always so sweet and the light of the Lord showed through her so brightly. Sometimes as a teenager especially, I would be embarrassed that my mom was so bold with her faith, but now I am so thankful that God gave me such an amazing mom to imitate and someone to teach me to share the gospel with the way that I live my life. Do others know that we love the Lord because of our loving demeanor and actions? So disciples are not only to love God and fellow believers, but they are to love all people as God commands us in Matthew 5:44. It says, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. 
I often find it difficult to love people who have slighted me or I feel have slighted me or let alone love my enemies. So let me tell you a story of a lady named Osman um, and how she loved those who hated her. So as the Taliban was leaving Afghanistan, hundreds of thousands of Afghans fled the country, but Asman did not. She stayed because she knew that the people of Afghanistan needed to hear about Jesus. She said, quote, fear was not controlling my heart. The Holy Spirit was controlling my heart. So Asman became a Christian at the age of 12, and when she met other Afghan Christians, she was amazed by the love that they showed her and how they received her so openly. Asmod said that 1 Corinthians changed her life by observing those believers living out that chapter in their own lives. She said, quote, to be a Christian in Afghanistan, now is a good time. There are many times I wanted to give up, but at the same time, I saw how thirsty people are here. It is an excellent time to be a Christian here. End quote. Can you imagine using the words good and excellent, describing what it was like to be an, a believer in Afghanistan? Afghanistan is the number one country on the world watch list of churches that are or, um, of Christians that are being persecuted. Um, she goes on to say, everything has become so precious. The Bible is a treasure. And she explained that I love baptism. It is the best. In Afghanistan, though, baptism means that you are accepting to be killed, to suffer for Jesus. When you get baptized, it is not, committing, it is not only committing to a church. It is saying, yes, I accept to die, to suffer, to be tortured, because I follow Jesus. How incredible is that statement? Because of faithful servants like Asman, the church in Afghanistan is growing rapidly. Would I have stayed in Afghanistan despite the danger? Would I have risked my life to share the gospel? Do I treasure baptism, even if it meant that I would be killed? So reflecting on those questions is so humbling, but we do have God's word, and we are equipped to love with an unconditional love that only God can give us. God has given me a love for him and the strength to rely on his word. So our retreat theme is going deeper. So how can we do this? Going deeper with our love. In 1 Thessalonians 3.12, Paul encourages the believers to increase and to abound in love for one another and for all. So the phrase to increase means to make abound or to superabound. And then the second word, abound, means to be super abundant. So basically, Paul is telling us to abound and to super abound. So Christians are to love each other in a different way than non-believers love each other. God expects Christians to excel in love that is surpassing and overflowing. So picture a cup that is filled to the brim and then picture a cup that is just continuously overflowing. People re will receive the overflow of our love that originated from God. So 1 Thessalonians 4.9 also reinforces the command to love more and more, as Paul says. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia, but we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. Paul expresses to the Thessalonian believers that they were already displaying love throughout Macedonia, but he encouraged them to do it more and more. So our church koinos means living life together, and we do a, I think we do a great job of taking care of other believers in our body, and I am amazed with the love that is shown between members in life groups, D groups and close friendships. And I know I have been shown sacrificial light, love by Koinos members when I've gone through some difficult times. And then I try to turn around and love the body as I have been loved. I have heard testimonies of members giving sacrificially of their time, their finances, and their care. 
Just as the church in Thessalonica already showed their love to each other, so have we at Koinos. But Paul and God calls us to abound in love and to love more and more. So how can we follow this command with our brothers and sisters at Koinos as well as unbelievers in our life? Number one, first of all, we must consistently think about, rejoice, and thank God for his incredible love for us. If we're not convinced that the God of the universe loves us with an overflowing love, we will never be able to love as God loves. The more that we spend in God's word and soak in the love that he has for us, the more we are compelled to share that same love with others. Number two, we must ask God to empower us to love others. We can all be hard to love, at love sometimes and struggle with selfishness and self-centeredness. People do things that bother us and sometimes they even sin against us. But we need to regularly ask God to give us strength to love in all circumstances. Number three, we need to pray for those who are difficult to love. I don't like conflict and I will shy away from people who have slighted me or I feel that do not like me. I have begun the practice of praying for those people who I struggle to love and it is definitely difficult to think unkind thoughts of someone when you are praying for them. And number four, finally we must take action. We cannot wait until we feel like loving and if we do, we will never love as God loves. Agape love is action-oriented, and we must do loving things, such as forgiving and serving others. We often do not feel like doing these things at the moment, but real love always seeks the good of the other person. So in closing, John Piper, one of my favorite authors, sums up the love in 1 Thessalonians perfectly by saying, It is love when you love someone in order that God will be glorified. It goes like this. God is doing whatever it takes to enthrall the beloved with the greatest and longest happiness, even if it costs you your life. And what will enthrall the beloved with the greatest and longest happiness is the glory of God, all that God is for them in Jesus. Therefore, love for people means doing all that we can at whatever cost to ourselves, like Jesus did, to help people be enthralled with the glory of God for now and forever. That's it. That's it. <laughs>